The intrepid Captain Foley and Commander Cockings returning once again to give you another designer briefing on one of the most iconic Star Trek ships. Hi, Stuart. Hi, Rick. <laughs> Hi, guys. The voyage we are about to embark on is a dangerous and uncharted one. And to help us through it all is the very awesome Rick Sternbach. Welcome back to the show, Rick. It's great to see you again. Hey, guys. What's up? Okay. Well, if you haven't guessed by the hints I have been dropping so and, far. And I've been guessing. It's pretty obvious. Pretty obvious. <laughs> All right, the topic of today's discussion is the Intrepid class USS Voyager, as designed by Rick himself. So let's find out about what went into this whole process. Stop playing with your toys and ask him your first question. So Rick, let's start at the beginning. Yeah. <laughs> so how did you find out that you'd be in charge of designing the new hero ship, uh, this new version of Trek that would literally be going where no one has gone before? Well, you know, toward the end of Next Generation, Deep Space Nine was, you know, was already in production. Uh, but at the end of TNG, we heard that uh, that they were contemplating a, another series to uh, to follow Next Gen. As far as my personal connection to designing the ship, um, that wasn't uh, that wasn't really locked in at the very beginning. Uh, there were a few of us who were illustrators within the franchise and. Everybody started putting in, you know, some uh, some ideas. Uh, Michael Kuda had some some ideas. Doug Drexler, uh, you know, was turning out some some small uh, rough CG models. Uh, I think Jim Martin was in there. I was in the TNG art department as senior illustrator. The basic uh, uh, description that we got, which was, you know, which wasn't very very specific at all, was, you know, a smaller, leaner faster uh, Starfleet ship. Okay, starting with that, I just started sketching. It, it was a five-month process, really, uh, to get from uh, little sketches up to preliminary, you know, do not build from this blueprint. I did a full set of, uh, of uh, very basic blueprints. The things I took away from the description were Smaller, faster, sleeker, getting away from the traditional saucer shape. Um, you know, it's, it's, I think that's something I, I grabbed onto almost immediately. Okay, uh, Starfleet ships could be streamlined looking in the vacuum of space or, you know, under warp flight. Uh, the shape really doesn't matter that much, but, you know, visually, stylistically, you want something to look fast, it has to sort of kind of be a little bit pointy, um, and, you know, and, and we can make that work. We could make that work. Voyager started out in a very, very basic sketch form as a very pointy, smaller ship. So at what point... Uh, in the in the process, did your uh, sketch get picked? What, what what point did you know you were the man behind Voyager? It's 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 hard to know. It, it uh, you know the producers were were contemplating a number of different designs. I continued doing lots of sketches, submitting them. We also got to the point where we had a uh, uh, like maybe a, a three and a half foot uh, mock up. Uh, built. Um, and I think gradually the bulk of the work fell on me as the, the senior artist, uh, you know, for the Voyager series. Uh, the TNG became the Voyager art department. Um, and, uh, you know, our, our positions never really changed. Um, I, I think the other illustrators, you know, from the DS9 side of things, I, I think it was good to have their input. Um, some of the designs were, you know, a, a big departure. Some were not as, as, as big a departure. Along the way, I began getting more and more feedback uh, from the producers as to, uh, you know, just, just what this smaller, 
faster ship, uh, you know, might look like. There was one point where, you know, I had done a, a series of pen and ink sketches, uh, preliminary blueprints. Uh, we did the mock-up uh, that was that, that was very pointy, and uh, the propulsion system for the uh, preliminary design was really borrowing heavily from the runabout. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, that's, that's a great see, design. By the way. You would see the uh, some of the glowing warp machinery up on the top of the engineering hull, just like the runabout. The pylons were going to curve down uh, to to the big nacelles. Okay. Uh, and uh, after they looked at the mock-up, uh, Jerry Taylor, you know, she was terrific. She, uh, she asked me, could you make it a little curvier, kind of like a Lexus? <laughs> and I said, Jerry, you know, for you, anything. Part two of the design process kicked in. And uh, uh, a lot of the angular, <clears throat> a lot of the angular parts from the mock-up were smoothed out. Um, <clears throat> but from an engineering standpoint, everything that a Starfleet ship should have was still there. Just the style changed a little bit. Okay. Uh, you know, I submitted maybe, you know, eight different nacelle designs, detailed drawings of, uh, of some of the different parts of the, the new version. And, um, uh, very slowly, you know, uh, feedback came back saying, okay, we like this one, we like this one, uh, these others, maybe not so much. And all of the approved uh, looks were, you know, put together into one final design. Uh, and, you know, and again, in episodic television, uh, you know, we there there are other people that that need all of this information. So, uh, blueprints had to go out for bids uh, for the uh, for the miniature to be built. We did kind of launch into CGI very early on Voyager. So some of the shots you see are CG, and some are the the miniature. The business about the uh, the rotating pylons uh, that uh, you know that came into play. And I think it's uh, worth going into that story because that is the next point um and i'll read the script because we wrote it so now the most obvious new design element uh that everyone knows right away is the and some would say overly complicated warp nacelles the fact they move into different positions obviously up being warp down being sublight so what mm -hmm. was the thought process behind this uh was there in universe reason um and maybe after the end of the show did you make even more sense of it in your head? Um, for this, you know, very design, very unique design aesthetic. I mean, it wasn't seen after, wasn't seen before. Uniquely Voyager. Uh, it, the, the producers wanted something on the ship to articulate. Hmm. Um, so, without getting into you know a transforming robot kind of a mode, we gave them uh, maybe five or six different things that might uh, that might move a loading ramp. Uh, okay. Uh, maybe some uh, some flaps on the outsides of the nacelles. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, if the flaps are open, it's like a supercharger. I, I did a few very rough sketches of a swing wing, like an F-14. Um, you know, something, just anything to, to you know, to, just to give them choices and have them point to something and say, okay, let's do this. And the, uh, the rotating uh, pylons, you know, became the the articulation of choice you know we could very quickly rationalize that as as being part of that uh, that business about warp flight damaging the environment yeah. okay that's the only thing i can think of <laughs> um okay you know we never we never heard of that problem again <laughs> um hey you fixed it well done. good job right? exactly <laughs> well, this we, is the delta quadrant okay so maybe yeah. you, you know Okay, maybe uh, you know back when when uh, Starfleet was was designing Voyager, it was a problem. Okay, later it became not a problem anymore. Yeah. Uh, but you know if, if if Voyager changing the orientation of the of the nacelles meant a more efficient warp field, you know 
Great. That's a techie, you know, that's a techie uh, uh, explanation that could be, you know, played with later. And what I'm hearing really is that Andrew Probert started just destroying space warp travel time with his Enterprise D. You were tasked to fix it with your, with your uh, Intrepid. And then John refined the design and didn't need it anymore. That's what I'm hearing. You guys. Yeah, you work together to yeah. save space. <laughs> Another very obvious design element was the difference uh, in the shape of the primary saucer, being much more pointed and less round or blunt, as in the case of the Galaxy class ships. Obviously, this was because of your direction for the smaller ship being faster, smaller, sleeker, and more robust. But what are your thoughts on the fact that this decision likely influenced all the Federation designs to come, such as the Prometheus, as well as the Enterprise E, and many others? You are the father of the new design aesthetic, as it were. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I, I, I don't, you know, I don't know if I can take credit for pointy Starfleet ships, but uh, uh, I mean, there certainly are, you know, there certainly are stylistic reasons to do it, uh, you know, for for episodic science fiction. Uh, you know, it it looks cool. And that, and the producers are always looking for something that looks cool. Okay, um, can you explain it technically? Yeah, probably. Um, yeah, but uh, uh, the, the Enterprise E was definitely, you know, longer in the in the fore to aft direction, uh, um, and yes, you know, Prometheus, uh, I made, you know, almost like a throwing knife. Okay, it was it was more of a, a military experiment. It was supposed to look like it could just, you know, trash any enemy that came up against it. Um, the, uh, the Equinox also had a sort of a throwing knife kind of vibe to it. I don't mind seeing uh, pointy ships in the mix. Uh, you know, we certainly have rounder, smoother, uh, ships in, in track and they've, you know, they haven't disappeared. Uh, yeah. we just added a few, a few more, uh, shapes, you know. So let's talk about ship dimensions. It, it's not a very big ship, like you already said, um, but was the specific size that you chose, was that laid out by the producers, the writers, and the early concept? Or did you very specifically pick that size? We gave the, the producers uh, some scale comparisons. Uh, you know, I did a little sketch of Voyager at uh, 1,000 feet, uh, another one at uh, maybe, you know, 1,400 feet, uh, and put those up against uh, line drawings of the Enterprise D. You know, they use the Enterprise D a lot as a, a yardstick for enemy ships, uh, for other Starfleet ships. And it was usually, okay, make the Vorcha three quarters the length of the Enterprise D. Okay, so three quarters became, you know, a, a, um, a, a peg uh, for them because they wanted nothing, really to be bigger than the Enterprise D, okay? Except maybe the Romulan Warbird, mm. you know? That was that was a, a big, bad ship, you know? Um, so we, we gave them, we gave them uh, uh, sketches uh, uh, at a few different lengths, okay? And Rick Berman looks at the 1,000-footer and maybe the 1,400-footer, and he says, okay, let's split the difference and... No, you know what I think it was? I think it was 1,000 feet and 1,250 feet. <laughs> okay, I mean, we did lots and lots of these little uh, comparison sketches, and, uh, and Berman looks at, at, uh, at, the, uh, at the comparison, and he says, look, let's make it 1,130 feet. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. 1,130 feet it is. You know? but, but that worked for me because it was in the range. It was in the range that we were thinking. It's a similar length to the original series Enterprise. Mm -hmm. uh, just a different distribution of the volumes. It had a you know a primary hull, an engineering hull. It had nacelles and pylons. You know, now we have to kind of make it all pretty. In in retrospect, do you think it would have been better to make it larger or smaller? Do you think? Did you have in your mind it should have been a larger vessel? Because we talked in our DS9 special about you originally had it to be a different size. Did you maybe half hearts want Voyager to be bigger or smaller? Or was that fine for you? I, you know, I, I, I didn't have my heart set on any one size because uh, no, matter, no matter how they scaled it, 
we could, you know, configure the number of decks, hmm. uh, put the, you know, put the warp core where it needed to go, put the, you know, the windows at the proper sizes. You'll notice on Voyager, the windows are proportionally larger just to, 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 you know, give you that visual cue that, okay, this is a smaller, a smaller vehicle. Hmm. And you it know? has to be asked in regards to the size of the ship. Was it difficult to keep the sizes you initially decided upon? Because I know that in our discussions with you about the Delta Flyer, that the shuttle bay doors were not necessarily big enough to accommodate the flyer. Mm. Do, you, do you think that the crew modified the shuttle doors at a layover somewhere? Or are we just accepting that this whole size conundrum for what it is and pretend that it's, you know, it's fine because it's TV? <laughs> and were there any other size uh, issues that came up in the course of the show? Uh, size issues with Voyager, no. With the ship itself, no. Uh, with everything that plugged into the ship, like the Delta Flyer, um, you know, that uh, the Delta Flyer size issues came about really because of the history of uh, were we going to actually build the shuttle bay? Hmm. Uh, and the, the door width, you know, was part of that problematic mix. If I was to make uh, a scale diagram of the deck, uh, you know, like deck, deck 10 for the shuttle bay. Okay. I would just pooch the doors out wider. That's all, you know, because I, you know, I keep telling people Trek is what's inside your head. And it's not a monkey brain. According to Doug Dreisler. <laughs> <laughs> so you know, um... if I want to make those doors bigger, I'm going to make them bigger. <laughs> So um, Voyager and the Intrepid design uh, is one of my favourite Trek designs. I think it, it it it's sleek yet keeps a lot of that classic aesthetic, you know, from TNG and earlier. I think it the Sovereign pushes the boundaries as far as sleek Trek. The Intrepid, I really think, is a great middle ground, um, but just about sleeker touch. Although one thing I thought while writing this, because I've always got to try and add something a little bit different, um, and I know, probably know the answer, but I've got to ask: Was it ever, even from day one? ever conceived that it might be able to separate there are no obvious uh, separation lines but this is 24th century i mean i'm sure they could do away with that actually have the distinct lines zero zero no there were there was never a discussion of the thing separating um surely that would be a feature uh, of all trek ships to some extent why was that not mentioned do you think or brought up well i think i think that it you know if you if you think of voyager as just an enormously huge shuttlecraft uh, you know, that, that's one way to think about it. Shuttlecraft don't pop apart. Neither did the Defiant. Voyager, well, that's a very, Voyager. very small ship. But... Huh? Well, the, no, come on, the TOS Connie could separate, and that's the same size. So you can't tell me it's just because of the size. No, this was, this was a, this was a, you know, a, a one complete starship that, uh, you know, that was not going to pop apart. Except for the Aero Shuttle. Which was never used, unfortunately. No, yeah, the Aero Shuttle was a you know That's was a casualty episode. of uh, you know of of uh, you know storylines and whatnot. But we're going yeah. to do an episode uh -huh. on that in the future because I want to know all about that. Um, yeah. But Rick, imagine for one second it could separate and you could see it pop apart. Yeah. How do you think that would look? Because I'm sure I'm going to do it right next to us. How do you think that would look in your mind if you could separate the ship? Oh, it it well, I mean, look at the Enterprise E. You know, um, you know, Enterprise E was was not originally designed to separate either. But you know, John Eves put some uh, some sep lines in there, and he did a sketch of the two separate parts. Hmm. Uh, but you know, there's nothing in the canon that says that yeah. that ship was going to be able to separate. Uh, Voyager to me was you know one fast little you know one fast little ship, a single ship. Um, and you know, it, but it, to, to answer your question, you know, if, if, if I were asked to, let's say, do a yard upgrade <laughs> and, uh, you, you know, put some sep lines in there. Yeah. I mean, I could, I can very definitely, uh, break the thing into, you know, uh, the forward hull and, uh, you know, an independent, you know, battle section or whatever, you know, whatever you want to call it. Yeah. Um, you know, design wise, yeah, it can be done. Um, I, I, I personally don't see any, any reason to do it. So before we Assault mode on the voyage. <laughs> there you go. 
Yeah, I, I think I think with Prometheus, we you know they got that whole separation thing out of their system. <laughs> that would have been cool though for them in the Delta Quadrant. I think it could have come in handy on multiple locations. All gone and blown up. Okay. Just saying. So, Rick, if you had to pick, because why not I'll get you on for the, the final Voyager episode, what is your favorite one design piece of the Voyager, and what is your maybe one least favorite piece? You know, I think that... Uh... <laughs> I think the, the the piece that I that I really really enjoyed doing, but we never got to see, was the Aero Shuttle. Uh, you know, it was um, you know it was it was one of those uh, it was one of those things where you know on the on the Enterprise D, we never got to see the captain's yacht. Mm -hmm. uh, yes. yes, they they did a captain's yacht in the in the feature films, mm -hmm. uh, but you know the poor Aero Shuttle was uh, was left. Uh, you know, to survive as a uh, CGI test. Yeah. Uh, and, and, and the test looked terrific. You know, that would have been a terrific, yeah. you know, small ship to, to go different places. Um, you know, and, uh, you know, I, I liked most of the, most of the, the, uh, the hull bits on Voyager. I think the, the, the bridge module was another one of those things that, you know, got designed in but never really utilized because you know a story never came up where the bridge had to separate um you know the bridge module on the enterprise d you know was a swappable module we lucky folks who got to design ships for the franchise you know we put all sorts of cool things into these designs um the fact that they never got filmed well okay that's that's something we we simply have to live with um, that's why Trackyards is here because we have that portal for us information yeah. no one knows yeah. Okay. yeah and oh you know and I like the fact you know a lot of people don't uh, uh, you know a lot of people don't think that the, the the result was that appealing but I did like the fact that the ship could land hmm. you hmm. know it was, it was a great design challenge how do you how do you cram four telescoping legs into the bottom of that hull. Yeah. Okay, and we did it. <laughs> yeah. Looks great too, by the way. But anyway. Yeah. Okay, everyone, there you have it. The process of designing the USS Voyager from the very man himself, Mr. Rick Sternbach. Thanks for joining us again today, Rick. It's, as always, it's been a pleasure to have you on the show, and we look, we look forward to having you on board for more, many more episodes in the future. Great. Thanks a lot. Yeah, I'll be here. Great. And, of course, we hope that you guys enjoyed the show. If so, please hit the like button and subscribe to the channel. If you want to check out more of our content, please visit truckyards.com or simply search truckyards on YouTube. Also, don't forget about the Facebook group, as there's always lots of great stuff going on over there. But we also have the Declassified Truckyard page now as well, uh, which is an insider's look at all behind-the-scenes truckyard awesomeness. If you would like to become a member of the group, please head on over to truckyards.com and click the Donate button, and you too can be a member of this very exclusive group. All right, everyone, until next week, this is our special guest, Rick Sternbach. Come on, the Calkins. And myself, Captain Foley, signing off until next time. Bye, guys. See ya. <laughs>